Welkom bij de leiderschapspodcast van City Life Church. Dit is Leadership Talks. Mel Fletcher, thank you for being with us. Um, we already heard from you here live at the Leaders Conference. Uh, very interesting uh, material. And today we'll be doing an interview um, talking about leadership, also talking about the future a little bit. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having Great. me. Great. Even so, if you get to sit on a better seat than me. Yes, they said you had the best background now. <laughs> I have the best background, but I can't see it. <laughs> right, so um, every Leadership Talks episode starts with this one statement. It's, uh, it's John Maxwell's quote, which says, um, leadership is the problem and leadership is the answer. What is your view on that? I think I understand the sentiment. I don't totally agree with the statement. I think leadership on its own can't achieve anything without, without people who follow. So uh, sometimes we forget that the people who follow are important to the leader, just as the leader is important to the people that follow. Collectively, we bring about change. I believe my definition of leader has come about over many years of thinking about it, and it took me many years to get to this sentence. A leader is someone who articulates a vision, maps out a strategy, marshals activity to create an environment in which people flourish and projects fly. So let me just repeat that. Mm -hmm. A leader is someone who articulates vision of the preferred future, not just the future of the organization, but the future of the wider city. Mm -hmm. Having done that, we develop strategy because vision without strategy is just wishful thinking. Having done that, we marshal activity, which means we bring people into the enterprise, whether it's a church or a business or whatever, that complement our gifts, have different gifts than us. And having done that, we're creating an environment or a culture in which people flourish and projects fly. I believe leaders are cultural architects. Mm. That's what they do. Managers are structural engineers. They're important, but leadership is something different. They're cultural architects. But without people following, leadership can't really change anything much. Interesting. Wow, that's, that's, that's a good start. All right, so before, um, uh, before we would dive into um, more of this, I found a few of your books and this one particularly is your oldest, as you said. It's uh, called Youth, the Endangered Species, Helping Youth Survive in the 90s. Since you published this one in 1991, I just turned one when your book came out. Um, and I, I, re I still remember how good it was. <laughs> no. <laughs> this one actually, and, and I would like to quote uh, something from the book just because it's, it's very interesting. Actually, I was preparing even last night and, and it was so inspired that, um, that I almost forgot to, um, to stop reading. Where's, where's the quote? Here it is. It says, um, it says, from time to time, the church must change if it, is, uh, if it is to affect its society. And this is what you wrote in the 90s, um, talking about the importance of reaching the next generation. I, I, I think right now, um, still important. But how would you say the church needs to change or, or where? Uh, what is, what is re the relationship between the church and the society? That's a great question, Joshua. I think the church is, according to Christ, among other things, like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Mm -hmm. And in one of the other sessions here, I'll be talking a bit more about that. I think that in part, what Jesus was telling us as the church is that we are to be in microcosm what the city could be if it lived under the values of the kingdom. So I'm not talking about an individual church, I'm talking about the church collectively across a city should be setting an example for the city of what it could be. So we should be able to say to the politicians of our cities, if you want to know how to share vision with integrity, mm -hmm. look at us, we're your city on a hill. We should be able to say to the educators of our cities, if you want to know how to raise up a generation that lives for something more than just self and materialism, look at us, we're your city on a hill. I think that's the role of the church and society, to be the model of what the city could be. Wow. And that changes a lot of things. It changes the way preachers preach, it changes the worship songs we write, mm -hmm. it changes the activities we get involved in outside of Sunday, it changes a lot of things. Yes, 
definitely. So uh, since I I, um, I found especially this book, but also over your 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 earlier years, you've been working a lot with youth and next generation. Um, you were actually the founder of Youth Alive in Australia um, before uh, churches like Planet Shaker were even started, or, or Hillsong Church wasn't pretty much wasn't even out there yet. Um, there's there's been a lot of fruit from that. Um, a lot of influence in the, in, the, in the world and in the Christian world, especially uh, over the years out of that. Um, you, you said that, for example, Pastor Gary Clark, uh, Phil Dooley, Russell Evans from Planet Shakers came out of the Youth Alive ministry. Beautiful. Um, so it's very interesting to see you um, work with youth and, and, and uh, young adults over those years. And now you ended up becoming a social futurist. Um, and how does that how did, did that go over those years? How, how did you end up from working with churches and youth in working with companies and businesses and organizations? How was that journey for you and why did you do that? Uh, well, the DNA is still the same. I mean, I'm still essentially the same, not the same person, we all grow, but I'm still driven by the same things. I'm driven by the desire to help people see that as a Christian, that God is relevant mm. to every situation and every time in history. Uh, and so futurism for me came out largely of doing research into young people because I was leading this national organisation that grew from 300 in Melbourne alone to 80,000 across Australia in 10 years. Wow. Wow. 10 years. So we were trying to, to get ahead of that and say, well, where are young people going? What's concerning them? What's driving them? What are the changes that will affect them? So that research then, when I came to live in Europe in the mid-90s, started to shift a little bit and become broader to the point where when we moved to the UK in, in 2004, it became something that the BBC and others wanted to know about. It's not just research on generations by now, it's on technology and ethics and social values and many other things. But it's always driven by the same Christian worldview. I had an interviewer uh, the arts editor for the BBC, who's a very high-ranking person, in the middle of an interview one time, he stopped me and he said, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, do you think that Christians are persecuted um, in the UK? And I said, no, here are my reasons. Uh, but something, I like to think something in what I was saying suggested a different worldview. Mm -hmm. And that's the role of the Christian, to provoke curiosity. Beautiful, different yeah. view. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, one of the books that you wrote was uh, the Pioneer Spirit: Redesigning the Future Through the Power of Faith. And as you, have, as we here at this conference, we already heard you speak this morning, and we'll have some more from you tomorrow. Um, but one of the things that you that you seem to be very um, convic convinced about, very very clear about, is is how important it is for for a church to be part of redesigning the future. How, how does that, what does that look like for you if you would look at churches and their potential in that, in, in that area? Well, I think it starts, um, this is where leadership is important, where a leader who is not curious about the city and the world in which they live will never lead a church that is curious mm -hmm. about the city. And, and if you're not curious, you'll never have influence. One of the key things about leadership of anything is remaining curious over many years, staying uh, fresh, exploring new ideas always. I think that every, every pastor of every church should take at least one day a month, one full day, to do nothing but go and sit in an art gallery or a museum or go to some other cultural, go to the theatre or something. Just do something that gets them out of church world completely and allows them to have fresh thoughts and ideas and exposure to different thoughts. For some people, it might be going to a library, whatever. It's important that we make it a discipline of our lives because curiosity is what gives you longevity. Without it, you'll last 10 years and then you're boring. Once you become boring, even church people don't listen to you, much less people out there. Mm -hmm. People in church will be nice to you. 
yes. for a while. They'll, they'll, they'll say, oh, yeah, it's great, Pastor. Thanks very much. Really enjoyed that. But behind the scenes, you're thinking, oh, that was so boring. <laughs> but if you're curious, it comes through. If you're exposing yourself to new ideas, reading. Let me ask you a question to anyone watching this and to those here today. When was the last time we read a book that we wouldn't normally read? Mm-hmm. Not a book about something that's unchristian, but not a Christian book, just a good book. C.S. Lewis said, all truth is God's truth. So if a thing is true, it doesn't have to be written by a Christian to be true. Uh, When did we last have coffee with someone who doesn't agree with us on everything? See, dissent is not disloyalty. I wish more pastors knew this because we'd have a lot more interesting pastors and more interesting lives. People can disagree with me in the media and online and they're not necessarily out to hurt me. They're not disloyal, they're just disagreeing. That's okay. So those sorts of questions are really important to producing leaders that are growing all the time themselves and that creates influence. Beautiful, beautiful. And do you you think that um, as, as, as most of them, uh, most of the people who are listening and also are here are not pastors, um, this would apply for them as well and how they would work in their jobs and, and interact with people. How do you see that influential church being their best on, on Monday? How, what does that look like? Well, it, it looks like recognizing that everybody is called. Mm. You know, 10% of Israel were priests, just 10%. So what's the, what's the other 90%? Are they peripheral? Are they extras in the great drama that God is playing out? No, they're central to it. The priests were there to help them be the, the, the representative of God to the nations. So someone who's in business or someone who's in design or someone who's entertainment in the media, they're just as called as the preacher is. But we've been slow to let them know that. And if we do let them know that, uh, we don't tell them then how to be a Christian in that role. Let me give you an example. I was speaking in a church in Aberdeen, which is the oil capital of the UK. So there are similarities between Shell, say, and Aberdeen. And the woman came to the church I was speaking in, and her pastor had been very, I'd been mentoring for some years on civic influence. So he was starting to have influence in the city. And she came to him after the service, a middle-aged woman, very well made up, crying. And he wasn't used to seeing her crying. She was a senior executive in an oil company. And he said, what's the matter? She said, this is the first Sunday I ever realized that God called me to lead an oil company. Mm. That's so liberating, Mm -hmm. you know? It's so liberating for someone to know, I'm in technology and God called me here. But when the preacher starts talking about these are the benefits of technology and this is how to use it, that person thinks, yeah, that's okay. This is my calling and it's a God thing. Mm. But if all we ever do is promote singers and preachers, and the people who are not called to that thing, eh, what's yep. here for me? Yep. It's yep. very important. Wow, beautiful. Well, that's amazing. 